Welcome back everybody to another episode of Direct Comparison. In today's episode, we're going to take an in-depth look at the recently released remake of Capcom's Resident Evil 4, and see how it compares both visually and from a gameplay perspective to the original Resident Evil 4, first released back in 2005. Before we get started, we're obviously going to see technical improvements to the visual design in just about every area. However, the goal of this video isn't necessarily to determine which of these two games is better, but rather to observe just what exactly Capcom has managed to accomplish in remaking this beloved classic, and how the new visuals are used to reimagine these iconic moments. Just like the Resident Evil 2 and 3 remakes, the Resident Evil 4 remake isn't just a graphical overhaul. The entirety of the game has been reworked, with more modernized controls, rewritten story, and some drastically different layouts to each of the game's chapters. But before we get into all that, let's first go over the many visual differences that have been made to the core graphical design. For this analysis, both games are being played on the PC, with the graphic settings cranked up as high as possible at a native 4K resolution. However, I have disabled effects like motion blur and chromatic aberration in order to provide cleaner image captures for comparison. Also, for reference, the classic Resident Evil 4 that I'm using for the basis of this comparison is the HD re-release of the PC version. Technically, the original GameCube release of the game is the preferred classic Resident Evil 4 experience, along with the PS2 version that comes with some additional content at the expense of visual quality. However, because we'll be discussing more general visual changes here, the HD PC version should work just fine. Also, while I will be avoiding major plot points and story details in this comparison, I will be discussing things like enemy types, boss encounters, and major gameplay sequences across all three sections of the game, minus a few major moments like the ending. So, if you've never played the original game and plan on playing this remake, then I suggest using the timestamps that I've provided to skip any sections that you don't want to see or hear about. Alright, so let's kick this comparison off by first taking a look at some character models, starting with the primary protagonist, Leon S. Kennedy. Leon, for the most part, has been retained almost exactly. His appearance has been updated to reflect the changed appearance used in the RE2 remake, and his old leather jacket and tactical black shirt, pants, and holsters are all the same. Though it's also worth noting the massively improved animation quality at play here with individual strands of hair bouncing as he runs, and more fluid walking and running animation loops that make him navigate the environment more naturally. I was especially impressed when I noticed Leon will even reach out and grab walls before he runs into them, a detail that very few games, if at all, have managed to incorporate. On a more technical level, Leon features a massive leap in poly count over his old GameCube counterpart, along with more advanced shaders, shadowing, and subsurface scattering, giving him an almost lifelike appearance in-game. Then we have Ashley Graham, who, unlike Leon, has been given a new base design to her outfit, with an orange jacket over top of her classic sleeveless turtleneck sweater. She's also now wearing dark stockings along with a plaid green skirt, instead of her just plaid green skirt from before. Ashley herself also looks slightly older in the remake, more in line with being 20 years old, whereas the original design and accompanying voice performance gave the impression that she was much younger. Her general AI and gameplay mechanics have seen some big changes too, but we'll get to that in a bit. Other supporting characters like Ada Wong, Louise, and The Merchant are a bit more faithful to their original designs. Ada does sport a new sweater dress, and Louise has gone from brown chinos to blue jeans, but otherwise, their core design and the personality that comes through with these design decisions matches up almost exactly to their 2005 counterparts. But of course, the world of Resident Evil 4 isn't occupied only by heroes. Most of the inhabitants of the local village, castle, and island are bloodthirsty abominations intent on killing Leon in the most brutal way possible. First up, we have the most common enemy type in the game, the Ganados, all of which have been greatly expanded upon with improved geometry, animation design, and visual detail. The hairs on the bearded Ganados in particular are very impressive, and the sheer density and variety in larger hordes really stands apart from the original game's comically recycled enemy types around every corner. That's not to say the variety in RE4 is flawless. You'll definitely kill a lot of the same character models, but it's at least improved a great deal. The rest of the Ganados from the later acts also share the same general aesthetic design as the source material. 
but there are a few interesting alterations that have been made, likely to enhance the gameplay experience. The monks with the red cloaks, for example, used mainly in this large tower sequence, have been repurposed as a distinct enemy type throughout the castle, which can trigger the Las Plagas mutation to trigger in nearby Ganados, while simultaneously stunning Leon. The spiky brutes, found mainly in the final island area, have also been dropped. In their place, the remake now features a brand new enemy type all throughout that wears a sort of bull mask. He carries a hammer, just like the old brute, but he hits much harder, and is also used in place of the minigunner as well. Another interesting change has been made to the Novastador, or insect enemies. In the original game, these enemies would simply churn invisible in certain areas, requiring the player to look for visual cues like water splashes in wet tunnels. To help make this more believable, the developers of the remake actually incorporated a new adaptive camouflage for these creatures that allowed them to blend in with the texture work before being triggered. It's a clever change and is certainly a more effective jump scare than the old design. There's a ton of other changes that have been made to the rest of the enemies in the game, especially the bosses. But as far as the visuals are concerned, most of these creatures appear to share the exact same core design elements that made them so popular in the first place. Only with far more detail than we've ever seen before, pleasing both new fans and old alike. Moving on, we have the environments. The environmental design is undoubtedly one of the most impressive aspects of the remake visually that helps it to really set itself apart. There were so many instances throughout the remake where I wasn't even sure I was standing in an area from the original game, simply because it looks so much different when considering more modern graphical design techniques. Structures have actual depth to them, for example, with each individual brick being rendered independently, whereas before, they'd just be part of an array of flat texture maps. The various buildings that make up the village also have more personality than before, with uneven walls, crooked rooftops, and more tangible wear and tear along the sides. The original game just looks sterile by comparison, with lots of straight lines and flat terrain. The interiors are almost always barren too, save for a few shelves and tables, whereas now, these areas are filled to the brim with appropriate detail, making them feel like actual places that people live. Vegetation is also scaled up considerably, covering entire paths and transforming them into something more natural, as opposed to before where pathways felt exceptionally clean and well-maintained. Most of the plants and grass will even bend out of the way of the character models, only further adding to the realism of each scene. The lighting is another area that has been given a much-needed overhaul. In the original game, and many games during the 2000s, levels utilized baked lighting exclusively, making the transition from outdoor to indoor environments appear jarring. Shadows had to be essentially baked in to account for smaller lights like flames or lighting fixtures, and things like caustics or ray tracing were obviously out of the question. But the remake is on an entirely different level here, with beautiful volumetric moonlight pouring in through the trees, while fires flicker along dimly lit paths in the distance and reflect off of small puddles in between the cobblestone. It's gorgeous in just about every direction you look, and what's more, this holds true across the entirety of the game, not just the first act. The castle in particular always looked really off in the original game, with seemingly dark castle hallways appearing brightly lit in every corner. But the remake transforms the castle into something that genuinely feels terrifying, with some sections being cast in pure darkness, with only a flashlight or torch to light the way forward. Ray tracing is also used for reflections like in puddles or the reflective marble floors of the castle, though these aren't necessarily as much of a game changer over the already great planar reflections used before. Still, it's undeniable how much of a big difference the newer lighting techniques make in illuminating these many locations. And then of course, we have the effects. Just like everything else here, the effects are a marked improvement. Fire animation is more fluid and realistic looking, accompanied by nice dynamic lighting that really stands out in these darker sequences. It also propagates onto enemies nicely, as opposed to the old firewalls used to represent things like the incendiary grenades from before. Water rendering is also technically more advanced, which is put on full display with this massive lake monster boss fight towards the beginning. However, I do want to point out the fantastic fluid rendering being used in the original game, which reacts nicely to the player and enemy movement. The remake also benefits from much better particle effects, explosions, and gore as well, which are often put on full display due to the action-heavy nature of the gameplay. 
And now we've arrived at the gameplay portion of this video. I've gone through and replayed the entirety of the original Resident Evil 4 and the remake this past week, and while doing so, have taken notes of every significant change that has been made across the game's 16 chapters. And the list is honestly overwhelming. The changes that have been made are even more significant than those made in the previous Resident Evil remakes, with revised gameplay systems, totally overhauled level layouts, and additional content. So first, let's talk about the revised gameplay mechanics. Resident Evil 4 was a big deal when it first released, as it reinvented the tired Resident Evil formula by placing the camera behind the character for the first time, thereby popularizing the over-the-shoulder viewpoint for decades to come. In the remake, the camera is once again positioned behind Leon and off-center, pushing him to the left side of the screen. However, the camera now can be manipulated independently of the player's movement, allowing players to look behind them while running in the opposite direction. General movement and traversal is also greatly improved, ditching the old tanky feel of Leon in the classic game, and utilizing something more akin to the RE2 and RE3 remakes, with much tighter control overall. Aiming weapons also no longer locks the player in place, though moving while aiming does significantly reduce the accuracy, as indicated by the crosshairs moving. Speaking of which, those white crosshair elements are now the primary aiming reticule used in the remake, replacing the old laser sight design of the original. However, the laser sight can still be obtained as an optional attachment, and is limited to just the starting pistol and the Punisher 5.7. Also new to Resident Evil 4 is the new crouch mechanic. Players can use this crouch function to navigate low-hanging obstacles, or, during combat, to duck to avoid projectiles. The same button is also used to trigger context-sensitive evade maneuvers, replacing the old alternating double-button press quick-time events from the original game. Leon's advanced CQC takedown maneuvers are also retained in the remake, but are now accompanied by new HUD indicators above stunned enemies making it easier to determine if an enemy is susceptible to a spinning kick or suplex, without having to risk walking up next to them first. Players can also destroy ammo boxes and barrels simply by pressing the action button now, instead of needing to awkwardly equip the knife and slash at it like before. Speaking of which, the knife in Resident Evil 4 Remake has been given a big update. Not only can it slash enemies like before, but it can also be used to perform finishers on grounded enemies preventing them from evolving into more dangerous Plagueis enemies. It can also be used to perform stealth takedowns, and is helpful for escaping enemies when they grab the player. But its most important change is its ability to block and parry. When an enemy attacks with a melee weapon, like an axe, pitchfork, or even the chainsaw, players can now tap the parry button to repel the attack. If it's timed correctly, this can even stun the attacker, leaving them open for Leon's kick attack is a nice change-up to the formula, adding more complexity to the combat. However, the indicator being located in the bottom right corner of the screen isn't the clearest visual indicator, and the knife itself now features durability, requiring players to constantly repair and upgrade it alongside their standard weapons. Another major change has been made to the game's inventory management system. In the old game, found items are placed in a big briefcase, with each item taking up a certain amount of space on a grid, Players would need to spend a lot of time organizing this case to make room for new items, and if there just wasn't any space left, they'd have to sacrifice useful gear by discarding it forever, or selling it to a vendor. But in the remake, organizing the case can be performed instantly with a handy auto-sort button, and if the player is light on space, they can store weapons at any typewriter save point, though items like ammunition and consumables are not permitted for storage, retaining at least some of the item management of the old game. The remake also adds in some brand new items to work with, most notably, resources and gunpowder that can be combined to craft different ammunition types. Normal boxes of ammo can still be found, but finding gunpowder is much more common and gives players a chance to craft this specific type of ammo that they actually need, rather than relying heavily on randomized loot drops from enemies. This new RE4 also brings with it new tools of the trade, including the versatile bolt thrower, that can fire silent crossbow bolts that can be picked up and reused. The bolts can also be swapped between explosive mines, thereby replacing the need for the old mine thrower weapon. Players that look carefully enough can even find more powerful firearms like the LE5 SMG or the CQBR assault rifle, 
though personally, I didn't get much use out of these due to the large amount of ammo necessary to make these weapons practical. Interestingly, the remake does see the removal of at least one weapon completely from the game, and that's the incendiary grenade, which was previously useful in a pinch to burn groups of enemies. However, in its place, they've added in a new type of frag grenade called the heavy grenade, which deals more damage and has a larger radius. The game's treasure items have also been given a pretty big redesign. In the old game, a lot of this treasure like little gems and spindles could be found hiding up on the ceiling or walls, and required the player to shoot them down to grab them. This is no longer the case in the remake. There's occasionally these sort of hanging lamps that can be shot down, but you won't find weird sparkly treasure embedded into the environment. It's instead often found in chests or locked away behind a special key that players likely won't find until later in that stage. The spindles also serve a unique purpose in the remake, in that they're rewarded directly to the player by the merchant for completing any of his new optional side objectives. These tasks are usually simple things like shooting some pests, destroying the blue medallions, or killing a powerful enemy in a previously explored location. Once these tasks are completed and churned in, players can then use their earned spindles to purchase unique items from the merchant, including weapon attachments, treasure maps, and even extra gunpowder if the player's running low on ammo. The old special treasures like the butterfly lamp, the crown, and masks all return as well, though the gem inlay system has been greatly simplified thanks to the additional gem combo chart, which indicates more clearly the bonus that players can expect when combining certain colored gems before selling the item. The shooting range has been changed up a good amount too. Before, the shooting range was designed to reward headshots more than body shots, and the only goal was to hit all the targets without shooting the wrong ones. In the remake, this minigame is much more extensive. Players can select from challenges directly at the range itself, and instead of focusing on headshots, players need only focus their aim to hit specially marked targets hidden throughout each challenge. The movement of the targets is also much more complex, making each challenge feel unique, and things like bullet penetration with different weapon types come into play more regularly to really mix things up. Then there's the rewards, that now come in the form of tokens that can be spent on a nearby slot machine to generate a randomized perk bonus which can be swapped out for other earned perk bonuses at any typewriter. It's a really nice addition, and I like how it's all handled independently from the rest of the upgrade systems, giving it a distinctive use in the gameplay loop, outside of the overall novelty. And then of course, we can't talk about Resident Evil 4 without talking about its most frustrating mechanic, Ashley. In the original game, players are tasked with escorting Ashley through a few sections of the game, and must protect her from the hordes of Ganados that want to steal her back. She typically stays close to Leon, only separating from him for certain sequences. But this means she also regularly gets in the way, sometimes even eating a bullet straight to the face if the player's not careful. The remake thankfully resolves this particular annoyance, by introducing a distance toggle where Ashley can either stay close to Leon to avoid being grabbed in a horde, or stay far away and slightly hidden during combat. They've also removed Ashley's health bar completely, substituting it for a new down state if she takes too much direct damage. Outside of those changes though, Ashley is pretty much just as helpless as ever, and will regularly get picked up and carried away in the worst possible situations. Though with the improved combat system, this is at least more manageable now. Still, it would have been nice to see her at least try and help now and again. Finally, let's talk about those big layout changes that I mentioned earlier. There's a long list of changes that have been made to each of the three main stages, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to run through some of the biggest layout changes that I encountered that I felt were the most interesting. However, please be aware that this section will likely contain spoilers, so I'd recommend using the timestamps now to skip to the sound section if you'd prefer not to know how the game's layout has been changed. So starting off with the initial village chapters, we can see that the main path from the police vehicle to the hunting lodge has been extended a great deal. In fact, the lodge isn't even visible at first, requiring players to move down a claustrophobic forest path before seeing it. The interior of the lodge itself is also much larger, with additional rooms and an expansive basement that's used to further the horror element of this initial encounter. After players leave the lodge, they then need to venture down a path leading to the main village. In the original game, this path is actually slightly longer, as it incorporates parts of that initial path we saw in the remake, 
So it looks as though Capcom extended that first path as a way of building the tension more steadily towards this initial scare. The village itself is actually pretty similar to the original in terms of its core layout. There's the barns on the left and right, the houses in the center, the large tower in the back left, and the town hall building to the right of that. The connecting paths around this area are the same too, though the tunnel that was initially used to connect the town hall to the church area has been moved up a bit, making it more of a secret optional path instead. This section later connects directly into the first boulder run area that has been cut in favor of a much simpler rock slide moment, circumventing the need for the old cheesy button mashing sprint. Skipping ahead a bit, we have this industrial canyon area. In the original game, players escape and can immediately head outside into a wide open area where they can meet the merchant and begin sniping ganados at long range. However, in the remake, this interior area is combined with an interior section used after the canyon and is used as a brief tutorial moment to practice the new stealth takedown maneuver. The exterior canyon itself is more or less the same, though immediately after it, we see a few more changes as well, especially different enemy placement as players head back towards the village for the second time. Skipping ahead once again, we have the church area that doesn't feel quite as epic this time around as the increased vegetation makes the cemetery actually feel smaller and more compact. The church is also missing the previous puzzle located in the rear, though a similar hexagon based puzzle is introduced a bit later near the lake. After the church, players head down a catwalk across a swamp and then spot something terrifying in the lake with binoculars before heading down and facing it head on. The remake is similar, but it changes the layout only slightly by opening up a path after the catwalks directly through the mountain to a merchant the very same merchant that's only accessible in the original game after returning with the key to the church. By doing this, the remake once again avoids a cheesy boulder run, while simultaneously encouraging players to return to find any missing collectibles. After the lake monster battle, the lake then turns into a pseudo open world section of the game, with multiple islands and beaches to visit for extra loot. This replaces the old game's waterfall section completely, one of the first major sections of the game to just be cut altogether. Once players finish acquiring the key to the church, fight a giant, rescue Ashley, and defend a house with Louise, we run into another major section that was removed from the game, this optional forked path, where players can choose to either face off against more Ganados and the Chainsaw Sisters, or fight a second El Gigante in a narrow corridor. The remake makes this decision for the player, forcing them down the former path, likely as a way to make that initial El Gigante boss fight more meaningful in the first act. After fighting the twins, players are then immediately thrust into a confrontation with the intimidating village chief Mendez, who performs his iconic door locking animation at this exterior gate, rather than the barn doors like in the original. The remake then throws in a new chase sequence here that was never in the old game, which brings them straight to the barn for the final showdown. In the original game, this section has a lengthy cable car sequence, where players need to shoot Ganados on their way down to the barn, kill Mendez, and use his eye to open the final gate out of the village. But the remake scraps the cable car altogether, and Mendez's eye, while still available to pick up, is treated as a valuable treasure to sell instead. Next up, we have the castle chapters, which have been changed even more drastically than the village. First off, the path leading to the castle is no longer filled with Ganados, and players won't need to shoot at a speeding truck anymore. It's instead dead silent, with a broken truck along the path serving as more of a nod to fans. The drawbridge is also closed automatically behind Leon and Ashley, whereas before, the pair closed the bridge themselves to prevent the villagers from following them. Upon entering the castle, the player will find themselves fighting off a new Ganados type, the Monks that have armed themselves with crossbows and catapults. This is nearly identical to the remake, though the cannons can be aimed and fired manually, instead of being locked in place like before. Once inside, players have their first encounter with Salazar in the main entrance hall. This entrance hall initially housed a three-headed puzzle at the end, requiring players to venture off into the side rooms to find the missing pieces. This included a dungeon with the first Garador enemy, a large chamber called the Water Hall, and a second large hallway where Ashley gets captured a second time, along with another dungeon area filled with invisible insect enemies. The remake totally revamps this convoluted layout. The entrance hall is now combined with that second hallway, 
with chandeliers hanging above that Leon can jump between. The first dungeon is still located in a side room, though it's extended a great deal, making the confrontation with that first Garador more interesting. Meanwhile, the water hall is now connected directly to the back of the entrance hall, saving the three-headed puzzle for much later. And that second dungeon with the invisible insects is instead combined with a sequence later as well, where Leon is thrown into a pit by Salazar. Three makes see some new rooms added too, like this ritual chamber near the courtyard, and this expansive castle rampart section, where a second El Gigante will toss large rocks at the player. Though, rooms like this one with the creepy picture puzzle, the fire room, the swinging axes, the rolling platform, and the weird room with the hidden RPG enemies in the center treasure chest have all been cut out. Skipping ahead again, there's this section with the cage trap, where the player is forced to fight in extremely close quarters with another Garador. This has actually been cut as well, as it's only viewable through a cutscene, allowing the game to seamlessly transition over to the gameplay sequence involving Ashley. The Ashley bit has been given a much needed overhaul, scrapping all the monk ganados in favor of more armored knights, and expanding the size of the playable space to allow for better stealth and maneuverability when caught. The idea is still the same, with Ashley only capable of running and hiding, but it feels much more cinematic now, and offers a nice break from the general gameplay formula. After returning to Leon, we receive one of the bigger changes in the entire game, where Ashley is captured once again after freeing Leon from the cage trap. In the original game, Ashley is not captured here, and the two head to the large dome room filled with the flying insect enemies together. But now, players head to the dome by themselves, which connects directly to the throne room, thereby skipping the clock tower. This then leads to a series of underground sections that were previously split up into their own areas, including the initial invisible insect area, the run-in with one of Salazar's guards, the minecart ride, the battle with the two giants, the insect hive, and the first Krauser knife fight. Though, Louise now accompanies the player through most of this, which helps to greatly expand his role in the story. Because of this design choice, we do end up losing a few areas, like this exterior ruin section, and the weird, almost Egyptian pyramid-looking catacomb section. But otherwise, it's a solid change that helps improve the flow a great deal. Finally, at the end of the castle stage, we have the clock tower, which has smartly been combined with both the Salazar robot room and the final tower leading to Salazar himself. This removes the extremely weird robot chase sequence from the original game, instead using the robot statue as a centerpiece for decorative purposes, while maintaining the clock tower motif on the exterior and preserving the spiral stairs from the final battle towards the top. Salazar's boss fight has been altered completely as well, which is to be expected as his original battle was incredibly underwhelming due to his stationary position on the wall. Lastly, we have the final set of chapters set on the industrial island. This area hasn't actually been changed nearly as much as the castle, though there's still some pretty significant changes nonetheless. For one, new laser turrets have been added throughout this area of the game, which require players to reorient them to pass safely. The regenerator section has been expanded, with newer power toggle switches and more complicated door puzzles put in place. But the biggest change comes a bit later, after reuniting with Ashley for the third time. Instead of jumping into a large construction vehicle and driving down a road while Leon shoots from the back, players now need to defend Ashley in a new defense event, while she uses a wrecking ball to create an opening in a wall. Shortly after, the player is sent through a weird laser hallway connected to a sci-fi looking throne room. He then travels into another underground area, home to a terrifying boss called U3. This is probably one of the most disappointing omissions in the remake, as the entire U3 boss has been cut completely. There's rumors that he could return in an unannounced Ada Wong story expansion, but as it stands now, this unique boss fight is not in the remake. Though it is worth noting that the funny little throne sitting animation is still present, only it occurs earlier in Salazar's throne room instead. There's a few other big changes thrown into this chapter as well, but I think by now you get the point. The Resident Evil 4 remake offers some massive layout changes from the original game, so much so that both new and old players alike will likely be kept on their toes. Finally, let's wrap up with a quick sound comparison. 
Which of these two games do you feel has the better audio quality and design?
damn your big boy. And that wraps up this episode of Direct Comparison. Overall, the Resident Evil 4 remake is yet another impressive reimagining by the team at Capcom. They've gone above and beyond to totally reinvent this action-packed survival horror classic, maintaining the game's intentionally silly B-movie aesthetic, while simultaneously maintaining the dark atmosphere that helped to redefine the horror elements of the previous entries. The gameplay controls feel great, the added side objectives and shooting challenges build on the experience without feeling tedious, and the amount of unlockable content and bonus features really adds a great deal to the game's replay value. Visually, Resident Evil 4 is a stunning overhaul to an already great looking game, and while I would have liked to see the same great ragdoll animations from the Resident Evil 2 remake return, overall I'm very impressed with the results. But what do you guys think? Are you happy with the Resident Evil 4 remake? or do you still prefer the original game? Let me know in the comments section, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more content like this posted every week.